who is it that knows there is no ego? And you must realize, you see, that this is a problem created linguistically. I explain that language based on the sentence composed of subject, verb, and predicate contains the hidden belief system that events are started by nouns, by things. And so it's very important to understand that in the real universe, there are no things at all. And this startles people, because we think of the universe as the sum total of things. But when you go into the question, what do you mean by a thing? Uh, you ask children this question, what do you mean by a thing? And they'll say, well, an object. Well, I said, you've just substituted another word that doesn't tell me anything. Uh, well, they can come back if they're very smart and say, what do you mean by anything? <laughs> I got once in a class of the high school years, an Italian girl who said a thing is a noun, while she was getting warm. A thing is a think. It's almost the same word. It's a unit of thought, in the same way that an inch is a unit of linear measure, or a pound a unit of weight. And so in various languages this comes out. In German you've got Ding, Thing, Denken, to think. In Latin, Reis, Ding, Reor, to think. So when we reify, that means to thingify. And uh, A.N. Whitehead used to talk about the fallacy of misplaced concretion. Thingifying uh, what isn't there. But it's easy to understand this, although it's uh, a little bit of a shock to our common sense. For purposes of description, we must break the world down into some sort of this is the basis of calculus. How do you measure a curve? Well, you treat it as a set of points. And uh, in this way, uh, measure it. Although it isn't a set of points. There is no such thing as a point. Euclid defined the point as that which has position but no magnitude. I think it's right, isn't it, that in modern mathematics one doesn't define a point at all. You just assume uh, it's an axiom, really. So, when you ask how many things is a person, an individual organism, well, it depends on what point of view you're going to take in describing it. In the normal way, we describe one body as a body, and that is a thing. Physiology uh, describes it as many organs. Uh, physics describes it as many molecules or atoms or electrons, mesons, protons, what have you. And the uh, sociology will look upon you as only a part thing, because the sociologist likes to have his unit, a group, a society. And so it goes, it depends. Uh, let's take rabbits. Uh, the way you describe a rabbit will depend on whether you are a hunter or a furrier. It's the way you look at it, the way you describe it, so that the way of describing it always varies according to the use you want to make it. So that the world is not unlike a Rorschach plot. And uh, in psychological testing, we get people to describe Rorschach plots and say what they see in them. Now you can perfectly well imagine that we in this room could have an enormous Rorschach plot on the wall. And we would all discuss it and arrive at a consensus about what it was. And we would manage, in other words, to coagulate our different points of view. 
And if there were a very dominant person present, uh, he or she would tend to force the particular view upon everybody else and say, no, obviously this is not what you say. It is. Look, it's perfectly clear that it's bad. So we are living in the world. Only urban people have different opinions to this. Because urban people live in a straight down world. We call it straight, it's great. Uh, because they think in very simplistic terms. See, Euclid had a very simple mind. And uh, therefore, he discussed the geometry, which wasn't a measure of the Earth at all. It was the word geometry, it was from Greek, the Os, the world, the Earth, Gis, and Met, which means to measure. Now the Greek word.